spoke on this topic, why the Bible? And this weekend, it's going to be part two of that same message. And I want to title my sermon, The Power of the Word of God. The Power of the Word of God. Last week, I talked about the authority and the authenticity of the Bible. And this week, I want to talk about what the Word of God does in our lives. Can I just say it like this? The Bible is unique. The Bible is the book of books. There is no book like the Bible. There is no book like it in, in, like it in the entire world. It is the only book God ever wrote. Books written by men come closest to the truth only when they accurately reflect the message of God's infallible book. This Bible is, is unique because it answers some of the key questions that humanity deals with or humanity asks. Where did we come from? Why are we here? What is the meaning of life? And where are we going? The Bible answers all of those questions because it is the Bible is God's breathed out word. God, the creator, is speaking through this Bible. The church fathers would say it like this. The Bible, it is the pilgrim's staff. It is the traveler's map. It is the soldier's sword. It is the pilot's compass. And it is the Christian's charter. Amen. The Bible, it contains the mind of God. It is the way, it contains the way of salvation. It talks about the doom of non-believers. And it gives us this explanation or it, it, it talks about the eternal joy that we as believers will have. Amen? All right. I heard the story of two kids who were playing at the backyard, at the backyard of, you know, the, the, this, this grandma's backyard. And the kids were playing, and as the kids were playing, one of the kids noticed that the grandma is always reading Bible, always reading Bible. And so one of the kids asked his sibling, why is grandma always reading Bible? And the kid replied back to him saying, well, she is preparing for, she's cramming for the finals. <laughs> I don't know what season you are in, but let me tell you something. Let's cram the Bible. Let's read, let's read the Bible. Come on, can we cram? Amen. <laughs> All right. Let me just give you one more, one more um, story just to talk about the power of the Word of God. There is a powerful anointed servant of God back in India. He's now around 70 years old. His name is Pastor Vergis. Pastor Vergis has a church with about 15,000 people, you know, attending his weekly services. He is a, he's an anointed man of God. Many signs, wonders, and miracles have happened through his ministry. And he, pre and he preaches all over the world and especially all over India. And so this one day while he was out of his house, a man came to visit him. He, well, the man came because his brother-in-law was in the ICU or in a ventilator in New York. And so the man came to meet with the pastor so they can, go, they can join together and pray. Well, when the man came, pastor was not there at the house. And so the son, 14 or 15 year old son, his name, was, his name is Johnson, opened the door. And, and, and the man asked, where is your dad? And of course, Johnson said, dad is not here. And so the man left. And about two hours later, the man came back again, knocking at the door. And Johnson again opened the door. And the man asked for Pastor Verges. Johnson said, my dad is not here. And Johnson then went on to ask him, well, what do you need from my dad? And the man said, well, my brother-in-law is in New York. He is in a critical condition. 
He's in a ventilator and the doctor said he, he's got only 24 hours to leave. Something has to happen in that 24 hours. And so the young son said, 14, 15 year old Johnson said, well now Johnson is a pastor of a mega church in India. He's got about 20,000 people in that church. And so Johnson said, well that's, that's all. That's not a big issue. My dad would pray and I can also pray. What my, what my dad does is he would pray and I can also pray. So let's join together and pray. And so they join together, they begin to pray and Johnson prayed and Johnson said, God, my dad, when he prays, he sends the word. And so this morning or this afternoon, we are praying and we are sending the word. We are sending the word that goes quickly. Sending the word that moves swiftly. We are praying that the double-edged sword will bring healing to his body and bring him out of a ventilator. And after that prayer, the man left. And next day, around the same time, the same man came back to the house. This time when he knocked at the house, it was not Johnson who opened the door. It was father. It, it was the father. It was, it was uh, Pastor Vergis. And when Pastor Vergis opened the door, the man asked, where is your son? This time, this time, the man doesn't want to see the father. He wants to see the son. And of course, Pastor Vergis asked, why do you need to see my son? And the man explained, yesterday, yesterday, I was here. And your son and I, we joined together and we prayed for my brother-in-law who was in a ventilator. But the very time when we prayed, God did something. He, he prayed that the Lord will send the word and bring healing. And the very time when we prayed together, God did something in New York and brought my brother out of of that ventilator. Folks, can I say it like this? The word of God is powerful. Come on, somebody. Can I get some people to join together with me this morning? Would you shout out loud, the word of God is powerful. Would you open up your, come on, somebody, put your back into it. Would you say it one more time? The word of God is powerful. Amen. Listen to what D.L. Moody, the famous evangelist in the 19th century who died at the very brink of the turn, or brink, you know, at the turn of the 20th century. This is what D.L. Moody said about the Word of God. God did not give us the Bible to increase our knowledge, but to change our, our lives. He said the Bible will keep you from sin, or sin will keep you from the Bible. This is what Billy Graham said. If you are ignorant of God's word, then you will always be ignorant of God's will. I'm going to say it one more time. This is not my words, folks. It is Billy Graham who's saying it. If you are ignorant of God's word, then you will always be, oh, that's a hard word, ignorant. You will, you will always be ignorant of God's will. Can I just explain that? God's will is revealed in God's word. Amen. I don't know how many of you have heard the name William Lion Phelps. Most of you might not have heard that name. He is one of the famous English literature professor in the University of Yale, Yale University. He taught there for 40 years. He probably, this is what historians say, he probably taught more lectures outside of his classroom on the great themes of English literature than any other man of the 20th century. And in the introduction of his very famous book, Human Nature in the Bible, which he published when he was 57 years old, Phelps included a most remarkable paragraph on the necessity of knowing the Word of God. This is what he said. Everyone who has a thorough knowledge of the Bible, everyone who has a thorough knowledge of the Bible, may truly be called educated. And no other learning or culture, no matter how extensive or elegant, can form a proper substitute. Wow. Western civilization is founded upon the Bible. Our ideas, our wisdom, our philosophy, our literature, our art, our ideals, come more from the Bible than from all other books put together. It is a revelation of divinity and of humanity. It contains the loftiest religious aspiration along with the candid representation of all that is earthly, sensual, and devilish. 
I thoroughly believe in a university education for both men and women. But I believe a knowledge of the Bible without a college course is more valuable than a college course without the Bible. Wow. The Bible carries the knowledge of God, a knowledge that is far superior than all of the other education. The Bible, the Bible, the Bible. Listen to what Job says. In the book of Job, chapter 23, verse 12, I have not departed from the commandment of his lips. I've treasured the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. I've seen people who get angry when they don't get their food. I've seen people at around 11.15 looking at their watch Thinking, when is the service going to end? <laughs> Amen. But look at what, what Job says. I've treasured the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. And this weekend, I'm going to limit my words. My commentary will be very small. I'm going to give you verses after verses. Talking about the power of the word. So it is not going to be my words. You're going to hear what the scripture says about its power. Are you with me? All right. Listen to what David says. David says this in Psalm 19 verse 10. They are more desirable. Talking about the word of God. They are more desirable than gold. Even the finest gold. More than money and more than everything else of this world. More than the bling bling and more than the glitter of this world. The word of God I desire for in more. They are sweeter than honey. Even honey dripping from the comb. Wow. Now, let's go to First Thessalonians. We won't read John chapter, seven, John chapter 6 verse 63 right now. We'll come back to it in a moment. But let's go to First Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 13. I want to highlight a couple of things in terms of how the word of God should be received. And secondly, I want to highlight the effectiveness of the, of the word and what it does in our lives. Because I want to talk this morning about what the word the few ways in which the word works in our lives. Let's read First Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. For this reason, Paul is writing to the believers in Thessalonica, and he's, he, this is what he's saying. He is boasting about, boasting about them. He's appreciating them. He's patting them on their back. Because the people in Thessalonica, they were just so exemplary. They had this very special quality about them. And Paul says, for this reason, we also thank God without ceasing. Paul says, when I think about you, we all, I always thank God. I thank God without ceasing. Because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you welcomed it, not as the word of man, but as it is in truth, the word of God which also effectively works in you who believe. Now, the believers in Thessalonica, or the people in Thessalonica, when the word of God was preached, they received it not as words from men, but they received it as the truth. They received it as the word of God. And then he goes on to say, you welcomed it, you welcomed it, or the word welcome. I want to highlight that word welcome because that word welcome when you... In a study in Greek, it means you rolled out the red carpet. You had a wel welcome carpet out. You received it with great exuberance. You welcomed it with a warm heart. That's what you did. You welcomed the word of God. Now, I'll give you another example. One of my Pastor friends, my older brother, when he spoke from this passage and when he was trying to explain this word welcomed in its original meaning, this is the example he used. Once he was traveling to, a, to another country, he was invited to speak. And when he got out of the plane and as he came out to the, you know, the, the area where people receive you, 
the people there, the people there, they had this big garland and they had some people with drums playing drums. And as soon as he landed, here the people who were, rece who were receiving him put a garland and playing drums and walking before him and receiving, giving him a warm welcome. Well, that's what the people in Thessalonica did. When the word of God was preached, they gave a warm welcome. Have you ever had a cold welcome? I don't know about you, but I had some cold welcomes. I had, I had people refuse to shake my hands. I had people say, no, thank you. I'm not shaking your hand. Come on, somebody. The joys of being a pastor. Amen. <laughs> cold welcome. I don't think it's just me. I think uh, some of you, uh, at least at some point in your life, you had some cold welcomes. But this is what Paul says about the people in Thessalonica. You were not cold when you received the word. but You were hot. You were, you were excited receiving the word. Amen. I pray this over gospel center. That we will not be cold. That we will be hot. We will not be cold, but we will be excited and exuberant receiving the word of God. Come on, can I get some? I, tr I work so hard to make that point and you are still there. It's a good point. <laughs> Amen. Come on. Can I just say that one more time? I'm, ho I'm hoping that some of you will put your hands Some of you who did not put your hands together earlier, I'll give you one more chance. Amen. I pray this over gospel center that we will be a church that will roll out the red carpet and exuberantly receive the word of God. Come on, somebody. Talking about the exuberant reception, I'll give you one more example because it is not just a random event that happened in Thessalonica. You know, Paul, Paul appreciates this kind of reception. It is not just random in Thessalonica. It happened at another place too. And Paul makes mention of it. While Luke mentions it. In the gospel of, not in the gospel of Luke, in the book of Acts. When you read the book of Acts, Luke wrote it. Chapter 17, verse 11. This is what it says. Now the Berean Jews were of more, more noble character. I don't know how good of an English that is. I mean, I should not be making any statement, but any time when I say more noble, my father-in-law says, you don't say that. You just said noble. Well, it's in the Bible. He's not here. He was here yesterday, and I looked at him. <laughs> All right. They were more noble. Everybody say it with me, more noble. All right. They were more noble character than those in Thessalonica. Oh, wow. If Thessalonica was here in their noble, what's that, noble, nobleness? <laughs> if they were here, the people in Berea, they are up here. Do you want to be more noble? Two, three people said, yeah. That was a struggle, huh? <laughs> Amen. People in Thessalonica, if they were noble, here, like if they were, their level was, if their noble level was here, then the very noble level was up here. Amen. The Bible says they were more noble than those in Thessalonica. Oh, it gives the reason why. For they, people in balcony, are you all still alive? Can we, can we try this one more time? For they received the message. Oh, with great what? Eagerness. Come on, can we say that word? With great. Amen. And examine the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. Now, I had people come and tell me, you know what? I'm just listening to, to examine if what you say is true. People with a critical spirit have said that. Just examine it. Have you ever had people? Hmm. Now, let me explain to you what that word, that line means. Examine the scriptures. That word in its original, it means not of a critical spirit, like they didn't examine it with a critical spirit. They were so excited to make sure what Paul said is true. They wanted to validate that, validate that with the scripture. Are you with me? Now, let me give you an example. When I was in grade 12, grade 11, grade 12, you know, 
it's back in India, it's in college, not in school, in those days. I bunged most of the classes. I did not attend. <laughs> I did not know many of the teachers, and the teachers did not know me. And so, I had, I mean, if you have to write the exam, if you have to write the finals, you, you need to have enough attendance. And so I paid the man in the office who works in the office so that he will mark all the attendance. <laughs> the truth is coming out. All right. <laughs> and then the last two or three weeks, I crammed for the finals. I studied. I, I studied three last three weeks. But when the question paper came, like, I mean, I didn't have any idea like what it said. Like, but I wrote. I don't know what I wrote. I wrote. I I wrote whatever I studied. You know, it was I'm clueless, but I wrote it. And then two months later, the results came. And so back in India, the way it works, you know, your names, when they publish the results, your name will not be published. It is your code number. You are given a code number. So no one will know if you passed or not. Right? And it is code number. And so when the results came out, my code number, two of my friends had my code number. So they, early in the morning, they got the newspaper because the, the result is published in the newspaper. They got the newspaper and they looked and they looked their code number. They got, I don't know what they got, but then they all passed and then they looked at my code number. When they looked at my code number, I also passed. <laughs> it was a miracle. <laughs> <laughs> but I tell, I, tell, I, tell, I tell you this, they called me, they called my home phone, our home phone, and said to, said to me, Dino, you passed. And when they said to me, I passed, I could not believe it. <laughs> and so, as soon as I heard that I passed, do you know what I did? I did not brush my teeth, I didn't comb my hair, I was wearing my pajama, quickly took my bike and went to the place that I can get the newspaper, got the newspaper and examined if my number is there. And lo and behold, my number was there, and I was so happy. I, was ex I examined to validate what I heard is true. Are you with me? That's what the people in Berea did. They were not with a skeptical, oh, I hope, I I hope it is all wrong. No, no, no. They examined it to examine because they wanted it to be true. And look at the first part. And they received the message with great eagerness. Can I just give you all a chance to show some eagerness this morning? <laughs> Amen. Oh, wow, that, is, that was really eager. Amen. <laughs> all right, let's come back. Let's come back. Let's come back. So the word of God is received. It must be received with eagerness. You, are you with me? It has to be welcomed. It has to be received. Now let's go back and read First Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. For this reason, we also thank God. Look at all of the you words there. Look at that. Without ceasing because you received it. Maybe you can say, I received it. You heard. You welcomed. Can I, can I, can I, can I just say it like this? You hear. And when you hear it, you receive. Look at the progression. And, 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 and when you receive, you welcome. And then welcome means you believe. You believe. And then when you believe, when you hear, when you receive, when you welcome, you know what, what happens? It begins to work in you. If you want the word of God to work in you, you need to believe it and you need to walk in it or you need to obey it. Are you with me? Now, I, I like to pick on that one word there, effective, effective. Can I just say this to you? The word of God is effective. Can I say it to you that the reason why I'm standing here is because the word of God is effective. I know there are some people in this place who can attest with me this morning that the word of God is effective and that's why you are here. The word of God, come on somebody. The word of God healed you. The word of God delivered you. The word of God brought meaning to your life. Come on somebody. The word of God is effective. And look at this, it is effectively working, it effectively works in you. And so we can look at some of the basics, some of, some of the ways in which the Word of God works. First, 
it works to save us. Are you with me? The word of God, what does it do? It saves us. It is powerful to save. Now let's read, let's read the first Timothy chapter 2 verse 4. First Timothy chapter 2 verse 4 shows the desire of God, God's heart. Paul says God desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. How are you saved? You are saved by coming to the knowledge of the truth. And the heart of God is for all of you to come to that saving knowledge and for all of you to be, for all of us to be saved. Are you with me? If there's anyone listening to me this morning who is not sure about eternity, not sure about your relationship with Christ, can I just give you a chance right now? Receive him as the Lord and Savior of your life and be saved. Come on, somebody. The heart of God is for you to be saved. Now, let's read 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 19 to 21. The means he used, it's now even more clearer in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 19 to 21. As the scriptures say, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and discard the intelligence of the intelligent. So where does this leave the philosophers, the scholars, and the world's brilliant debaters? Where? God has made the wisdom of this world look foolish. Since God in his wisdom sowed to it that the world would never know him through human wisdom. Someone's got to get that. The world will never know him through human wisdom. He has used our foolish preaching. He has used our foolish preaching to save those who believe. Amen? Let's read Romans. You know, I, I think I'm doing a good job in terms of just sticking to the scripture. Okay, let's read Romans chapter 1 verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel. Come on. Because it is the what? Power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. First to the Jew and then to the Gentile. Now, what is the gospel? What is the gospel? Gospel is good news. What is the gospel? Well, let me just give you one scripture. It is not in the slides. Let me take your attention to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Paul explains the gospel. Do you have your Bible? If you have your Bible, open up to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. If you have your iPhone, uh, whatever you have, open it up. Let's get there. It's not there. All right, let's, 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 let's stay. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 15, verse 1 onwards. Now, brothers, sisters included, I want to remind you of the, of the what? Of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your, oof, you received and you've taken your stand. By this gospel, you are what? Oh, so by this gospel, you are saved. If you hold firmly to the word, I preach to you. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. Verse 3, for what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures. Uh-huh. That he was buried and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. And that he appeared to Peter and then to the twelve. I'm going to read verse 3 one more time. For what I received I passed on to you as of the first importance that Christ died for our sins. Yeah, okay. That he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scripture. I want you to know, scripture or, or, or the gospel is Jesus Christ dying or died on the cross of Calvary, buried and then raised on the third day and living on the right hand side of the Father. That is the gospel. Are you with me? Gospel is Jesus Christ. His life and his finished work. 
Now, what Paul says here is this. According to scripture, in other words, this scripture is full of the gospel. Did you get that? This scripture, come on somebody. Do you see the, do you see the connection? This gospel, this scripture is full of what? The main theme of the scripture is Jesus. Are you with me? And now come back to Romans chapter 1 verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God that brings salvation. The word of the point that I'm trying to make is this. The word of God. Let's, let's try that one more time. Am I talking to the right crowd this morning? <laughs> the word of God does what? The word of God saves. saves us. The second point, the word of God sanctifies us. Sanctifies us. Makes us holy. I'm still one of those preachers who believe that sanctification is important. You are sanctified instantly at the point of your salvation experience or your born again experience when you're saved. But there's also an ongoing process of progressive, of progressive sanctification. An ongoing process of sanctification or a progressive sanctification. Are you with me? We are saved. When we are saved, we are sanctified instantly. But we still have some junk. We still have some junk. You know, I... Have you ever had people wanting to come into your car and then instantly say, give me two minutes, I'll, I'll be back. Because you're running out to your car, opening the car doors, getting all of the junk from the car seat and putting it in the trunk. <laughs> Sometimes you have visitors come into your house and when you, have when, when you have visitors come into your house, you tell them, like, I mean, you give them time exactly when you want to come. But before they come, you are in a mad rush trying to get all of the junk from the living room and the family room and put it upstairs in your bedroom. Never got rid of the junk. You just moved it around. <laughs> and sometimes, when we come to the Lord, we carry a lot of junk. And what God wants is not just to keep moving the junk. He wants to slowly get rid of the junk. Amen. And the process of slowly getting rid of all of the junks in our life is called sanctification. Are you, are, you, are, you, are you with me? Okay, let's read. Let's read. Let's read. Oh, praise God. <laughs> All right, let's read First Peter chapter 1, verse 15 to 16. Look at the call. Look at what God commands. But just as he who called you is holy, talking about God, so be holy in all you do and all you say. I just added that. I hope you are okay. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. And that's a quote from the Old Testament. This is God's word. God directly saying, be holy because I'm holy. And Paul, Peter is now quoting that scripture. Are you with me? And the call is, be what? Holy. This is not a denomination's teaching. This is not a church's teaching. This is what God is calling you and I. Be holy. Would you look at your neighbor? Would you tell your neighbor, be holy? Oh, that, that neighbor was hesitant a tiny bit. I'm not sure. <laughs> Look at the other neighbor and tell the other neighbor, be holy. Be holy. How are you made holy? Let's look at John chapter 17, verse 17. Make them holy. How, how are you made holy? How are you sanctified? By your truth. Teach them your word, which is... How are you made holy? How are you sanctified? How are you cleansed? How can you live a set-apart life? Come on. The word. By the... Would you, would you shake your neighbor? Not, not, not just tap your neighbor. Shake your neighbor. Wake him up. <laughs> shake your neighbor and tell him. By the word. By the word. <laughs> tell the other neighbor that the word is a big deal. Oh, my goodness. 
I'm looking around. I'm, 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 I'm waiting. I'm, I'm giving you all just about two seconds to make sure you're going to do it. Amen. <laughs> Look at your neighbor and tell your neighbor, by the word. Amen. All right. Let's read. The sanctification process. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23. It says, now, the, now may the God of peace, come and join together with me and read it. Now may the God of peace make you holy in every way. That word, every way, some other translations would say, NIV, I believe it would say, through and through. Now, would you shout back at me? Would you say through and through? through. And through. So may God of peace make you holy. How? Oh, through and through, through and through in every way, through and through. And now he goes on to explain, and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless until our Lord Jesus Christ comes again. So your whole spirit, soul, and body must be kept holy or must be sanctified. Now, that's interesting. Whole spirit. Now, can I take... Just a few more minutes here. See, I, I, that's a good thing about having a good associate pastor. Amen. <laughs> when nobody supports you, you support him. <laughs> All right. Whole spirit. Whole spirit. Let's go back to the verse that we skipped. John chapter 6, verse 53. The verse that we skipped earlier. When we talk about changes in our life, sanctification is change. When we talk about changes in our life or in our lives, this is you know, what the secular world does. Secular world and the, and the psychologists and, and all of them, they, they a lot of time deals with behavioral modification. Behavioral modification, behavioral modification is changes on the outside or superficial changes. It's like apple tree is still the same apple tree, but you're trying to pluck all the apple fruit, or apples, and trying to put oranges on it. After a while, the oranges that you tagged on will fall off and apple will still come forth. Are you with me? And so, you know, all of that stuff is behavioral modification on the outside. If you, if you and I, if we need real change, it has to be hard change. It cannot be outside change, change on the outside. Can I tell you something? Change on the outside just makes us more pharisaical. Change, is, change on the outside just makes make us look good just to be impressive. <laughs> Amen. Change on the inside is a real change. Change should be inside out. How do we have change on the inside? A hard change. Now, let's go back to that verse. John chapter 6, verse 53. Ah, the spirit gives life. The flesh counts for nothing. The words I have spoken to you, they are full of the spirit and life. Are you, are, are you with me? The change has to happen in our spirit first, in our heart first. And... The word of God is full of spirit and life. In other words, the word of God can penetrate the double-edged sword, can penetrate the places that nothing else can, no, no psychology and no, nothing else can penetrate. The word of God will penetrate our innermost and will bring about a change on the seed level, on the heart level. Come on, somebody. Can I get some people? All of the other superficial change, after a little while, you go back to the same stuff. But when it's a hard change, you will never go back to it. And what can bring that change? It is the word of God because it is full of the spirit and life. Come on, it's a good place right now to put your hands together this morning. Amen. Now, second thing, Thessalonians, that verse, Thessalonians verse. Whole spirit, soul, meaning our mind, our emotion, our affection, our will, all of our thought process. I loved what Pastor Cheryl shared earlier. 
You don't have to believe the lies. Believe, believe the, the old lies. Are you with me? You can replace it with the truth. And when the truth comes in, when the word of God, the word of God is full of truth, when it comes in, it changes even your mind, it changes your emotions. You begin to walk in the new identity. Okay. Whole spirit, soul, and now the body. Now, this is an interesting one. Paul says it, the word of God says it, that cleansing process or, or that, that sanctification, that holiness should be, your body should be part of that. Are you with me? Everybody say it with me, body. I've heard people say, well, my body is my body. What I do with it is my thing. Have you heard that? Yeah. Let's read, let's read. Corinthians. First Corinthians chapter 6. Uh-huh. Some translation is, or do you not know? This is the tone Paul takes it. In some translation, I mean, don't you know? <laughs> I heard you. <laughs> Or do you not know? Do you not know that your bodies, listen, are temple? Oh, what is it? Your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God. You, oh, you are, you are not your own. You are bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. Are you with me? So your body is not your own. You cannot do whatever with it. You have to honor God with your bodies. Amen. I think you know what I'm saying. The world outside will tell you, you can do whatever, with, whatever you want to do with your body. Live whichever way you want to live. Alter it, change it the way you want to change it. Can I tell you something? Your body belongs to God. You don't have to live with the confusion of the world. Are you, are you, are you, are you, are you with me? Come on. What you do with your body is not the schools that will decide. It is, not the, it is not the teachers that will decide. It is not the government that will decide. What I do with my body, my God will decide. And the word of God, come on somebody. The word of God will decide how I will use my body. I will use it as a living sacrifice. Live in full surrender unto God. Can I just add this one more line this morning before I, cross, before I close? Can I get the worship team? I didn't finish my last point, but it's already 11.36. We got to do family blessings. So, you know, let's, 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 let's get the children up. I want to do my last point, but here's what I want to say. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. God knits you together in your mother's womb. You are not an accident, you are not a mistake, you are not a confusion. You are created in the image and likeness of the living God. Come on, somebody. And if you were not special enough, if you were not important enough, if you were not valuable enough, he would not have sent his only begotten son to die for us on the cross of Calvary. He would not have sent his only begotten son to shed the very last drop of his blood. Jesus Christ, the son of God, would not have come down and shed the last drop of his blood if you were not important. Can I just say it to you like this? You are important. And that's why you are valuable. And that's why Peter said, Says it like this in first, first Peter chapter 1 you are not bought by gold or silver as pricey and as precious and as costly as it may all look you are not bought by any of those things you are purchased you are bought by the very precious very precious blood of Jesus Christ come on can I get some people to put your hands together this morning We're going to ask the families to come forward. Families, as we're just about to sing a little bit of the song, come forward and we are going to pray for you. Pastors and ministry team leaders, why don't you come forward as well? We're going to pray. And this is going to be our prayer. That he will sanctify you. 
through and through with the word. Your spirit, your soul, and your body. This is going to be our prayer. That the word of God, it will be the lamp unto your feet. The word of God will be the lamp unto your feet. And light unto your path. That there won't be a moment in your life that you will wander or or you will be unsure about which way to take. Because the word of God will bring clarity. It will be the lamb. It will be a lamb. And it will be the light that will direct your footsteps. Come on, somebody. And we'll be praying. We'll be praying. We'll be praying that God's goodness will surround you. That your life will be a display of His glory and of His grace. Families come. Families come. Would you all stand up? Come with your children. If you don't have your children with you right now, just go get them. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.